Hello, and welcome to a special Earth Day Natural Capital Conversation. My name is Ann Gary, and I am the Chief Strategy Officer and Lead Scientist at the Natural Capital Project. And I'm just going to start with a few housekeeping kinds of things before I turn it over to the moderator for today's session, Katie Arkema. Um, let's see. So a couple of housekeeping things today's um, conversation. We have a simultaneous translation in Spanish. So the webinar will be presented in English with Spanish interpretation. The um, interpretation button is on the bottom of your screen. There's a little globe circled in red here. And if you click on that, you can choose either English or Spanish. And um, please be sure to um, mute the original audio so that you don't have to hear two languages at the same time. So make sure you select a channel in order to hear the webinar after you've clicked on interpretation by clicking on that little globe at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just a, a quick introduction to the Natural Capital Project at NACAP. We pioneer science, technology, and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. We, use, we aim to use understanding of nature's benefits to target investments in nature that improve the well being of both humans and nature. This series is called the Natural Capital Conversations that um, we started this pandemic year to try to keep our network together as much as possible. And the format is designed to spark engaging discussion, to learn from others' experiences, and to promote new connections with uh, collaborators, both old and new. And uh, these events have been featuring everything from climate smart coastal planning like today to cultural ecosystem services. And then uh, coming up next is land use planning in the Amazon. Today's conversation is a special one because it marks Earth Day. And I can think of no better way to celebrate Earth Day than to showcase the amazing work that you'll hear today about um, work going on the Mesoamerican Reef that aims to safeguard the life support systems of that system. I took this picture near my house last week just as spring was beginning to spring. And these buds, like the work you'll hear about today, give me so much hope. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for today, one of NatCap's lead scientists an ecologist who's turned her prodigious talents to working with decision makers and communities to shape more sustainable futures. So Katie, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Anne. And um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us today for the um, Climate Smart Coastal Planning and Sustainable Development session. And it's my pleasure to introduce this session and to introduce our panelists. As you all know, um, these past uh, few years, and that's more than a few now, past decades, have um, we've seen a market increase in the number of climate extremes and climate impacts, with wildfires raging across the United States and Australia, just in the news this week, there was an article about how one of the glaciers on Mount Denali in Alaska is moving at 100 times its normal speed at 90 feet a day. And of course, we have had numerous hurricanes um, impact our shores. And just this past summer, um, two hurricanes in the Mesoamerican Reef region exemplify the, the devastation that we're seeing in coastal communities um, across the world. Iota and Eta hit both Guatemala and Honduras. And our sort of typical, I think, response in coastal systems is often to build walls to protect ourselves from sea level rise and from storms. 
And uh, certainly there are some places where that is necessary, where there aren't any other options. But there's also large stress, stretches of coast around the world, and especially in the Mesoamerican region, where there's opportunities to leverage other kinds of approaches. And so the panelists today are all involved in different efforts across uh, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras uh, related to um, understanding better the impacts of climate in this region in particular, and working to develop a portfolio of ecosystem-based adaptation strategies that um, will hopefully help to reduce the risk to coastal communities, but also allow uh, these regions to still be able to harness the um, benefits, the coastal protection, the fisheries, the tourism, the carbon storage and sequestration benefits that um, underlying, uh, underlie the livelihoods and the well-being of so many people um, in these four countries. And so it's um, my pleasure to introduce um, our five speakers that are all involved in a project called um, Climate Smart uh, Coastal Planning, and um, in one way or another, and they'll be talking to some extent about their work related to that, and then some to some extent about other types of um, work that they do um, in their respective countries. So we have first Manishka Dalmel, who is a senior staff associate at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and Manishka will be talking about um, downscaling global climate model um, information to the Mesoamerican re region. And then next we have Fabio Cristoalina, who's a climatologist and is leading um, several different efforts in Guatemala related to climate impacts on ecosystems and also to the nationally determined, nationally determined um, contributions update for that country. After Fabio will be, um, uh, we'll have uh, Maestra Seda Rodriguez Gomez, who is the Minister of, and Secretary of Sustainable Development in the government of Yucatan uh, in Mexico. And she'll be talking about some of the initiatives that her team um, and her agency is leading related to sustainable development in the region. Uh, next, we'll have Arlene Young, who's Director um, at the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute. And she'll be talking about uh, sort of links between science and policy and the way that her agency is uh, leveraging analysis um, that's coming out related to climate adaptation. And finally, we'll have Luis Chavez, who's uh, with World Wildlife Fund in Honduras, and he'll be talking about some of the approaches that we're taking to identify climate adaptation strategies and to leverage the science to inform decision making. Next slide. Um, we'll have the first three speakers um, before a break, and the break will be five minutes. And then we'll come back and we'll re review the results of a word map activity that I'm going to share with you in a moment. And after that, we'll have our last two speakers. And then we'll be followed um, by some time for discussion. So for the word map activity, I invite you to grab your pencil and paper and write down www.menti.com and go to this site throughout the session when you're feeling sort of so moved to do so and enter the code here, 1842. 1756. And um, type in a word that you're hearing here, that you're hearing being spoken by the speakers or that is relevant for you related to these issues um, in your region. And we'll create a word map that uh, gives us all an opportunity to interact and keep our brains going as we're listening over the next hour and a half. And also will be sort of a nice product to showcase the um, content from this presentation. Next slide. I wanted to let you know that a recording of this webinar will be available on the Natural Capital Project's YouTube channel. 
and a PDF copy of the slides presented today will be included in a thank you email following the event. Some speakers will, um, sorry, Ann, will you go back to the last slide for a moment? Some speakers, most speakers I believe will be presenting in English, but there actually may be some speakers that will be presenting in Spanish. So if you would like to um, be able to uh, see the slides in Spanish, all the slides on the screen today will be um, for the most part in English. If you would like to be able to see the slides in Spanish, then please go to a link that Mary Jane will be putting in the chat so that you can download um, the a PDF of the slide deck in the language that you prefer. So keep an eye out in the chat for that link to a public site where you can download the um, slides in the language that you need. Um, also during the presentations, um, please submit any questions that you have for the speakers in the question and answer box. And those are content related questions and the speakers will do their best to respond uh, throughout the session. If you need any logistics or technical assistance, then please put that in the chat. And I already see there's requests for the mentee information and we'll get that in there shortly. Um, okay, and I think, am I done with my slides here, my intro slides? Wonderful. Okay, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Manishka who's going to kick us off. Great, thanks so much, Katie. And I'm pleased to, share an overview of the work we are doing in the Mesoamerican Reef region. We, will, we are working on assessing climate risk in the region and have been involved in this project for about two and a half years now. I will be very briefly going over a number of our climate variables we've developed. Uh, I'll briefly introduce some methods talk about how we've integrated climate risk into ecosystem service models and a couple of other related initiatives and some next steps. Just to introduce our center, the Center for Climate Systems Research is a collaborative entity between NASA and Columbia University. Uh, within CCSR, we are part of the Climate Impacts Group. We carry out applied research related to agriculture, urban areas and conservation. And then in 2015, we, we started a partnership, the advanced partnership with WWF to develop new ways to integrate climate risk into adaptation planning. As Katie mentioned, all of us are involved in the Smart Coast project in the Mesoamerican Reef region in some form or the other. Our main project activities include providing downscaled climate risk information for ecosystem service analyses and adaptation. We've co-led workshops to co-generate climate risk information. So we've got a lot of information from stakeholders and tried to tailor our information as much as possible. And we also provide guidance on how to use climate risk information for project planning and activities. I will be not going into any details about our methods. All I want to say is that we use multiple uh, climate model outputs. We provide projections for two emission scenarios. We work in time slices of 30 years and our focus for this presentation is mid-century. And we always go for a range. So we provide a low and a high estimate. And I'll tell you why we do that as well. We, the, the main, um, you know, the obvious uh, climate variable that we always do is, um, you know, we, we look to see how temperature changes across the region. And once again, I'm not going to go into details, but just provide a very quick overview. Um, you know, this is not surprising. Mean temperature is increasing everywhere. 
uh, it's increasing a little bit more in internal areas in the more mountainous areas than some of the coastal areas. And then under the high estimate, we see as much as three degrees Celsius uh, by mid-century. So that's uh, quite concerning, but that's at the high estimate and we're talking about RCP 8.5. When we look at extreme heat, we are looking here at days over 35 degrees. And we see a lot of that uh, even under the low estimate in some parts of Mexico and Guatemala. And then when we look at the high estimate, it can reach up to about 300 days a year in some parts, while others see about 150 to about 200, which is still very high. In the case of precipitation, under the low estimate, we see drying. And then even under the high estimate, we see quite a bit of drying in the central regions with some coastal areas showing a little bit of an increase. And here I'm just gonna mention why we always show uh, a range. And this is because if we take a range, for example, uh, you know, let's just assume it's uh, a range from plus 30 to negative 30% change. You know, this is just an example. It's usually not an equal range. But if you plan uh, for this, then we might realize that yes, you know, rainfall may increase or decrease. And therefore, you know, we realize that we have to plan for a couple of different possibilities. However, if we just average and show this, we might think that there's no change and that we do not need to plan or adapt to climate change. So this is why we always try to show a range. We also look at the change in the number of rainy days and under the low estimate, there's a decline. Even under the high estimate, we see quite a lot of areas seeing a decline in the number of rainy days. And this means that in areas where there's a decline, that means total rainfall occurs in a smaller number of days in a year. It's not surprising, very similar to temperature, there's only one direction, unfortunately, sea level is going in and that's an increase. And we see levels of almost up to a half a meter in increase uh, across the region. It varies really slightly. Uh, and this is using a range of data sets, including multiple climate models. This is once again, just an example to show that even if the intensity of storms do not change, if the storm state surge level is the same as before, just with future sea level alone, you see more water being pushed internally. So this is why even if the intensity of storms don't increase, sea level alone will push more water during storm events into coastal areas. We also develop projections for sea surface temperatures, and this is for the whole Mesoamerican reef, the ocean region. And we did this across uh, three different time slices. And by the time you get to the end of the century, you can see a range of two to four degrees Celsius. Once again, this is very concerning. Hopefully, you know, uh, the emission scenario that will actually occur will be not RCP 8.5. So that was just a very quick overview. I'm happy to go into details about some of the projections we've done. I just want to spend a moment talking a little bit about uh, how we integrated climate risk into ecosystem service models. You can read this case study in the latest UNEP adaptation gap reports in the S chapter. This is once again, we engaged with stakeholders. Then we worked with Katie and her team to integrate different variables into the sediment retention, coastal risk reduction, tourism and fisheries models. And then it informed a range of nature-based solutions which stakeholders have prioritized and will implement. They won't implement all of these, but they will be implementing at least some of these. 
We are also working on another study where we are using the Degree Heating Week um, metric, which is currently used by NOAA and a lot of practitioners in the region. What we're trying to do is we're trying to see how Degree Heating Weeks will change with climate change in the future. So that analysis will be ready in about a month or two. I just also want to mention another initiative that uh, we are a part of, and that is the NASA PACE program. The NASA PACE program is uh, a mission that is going to be launched quite soon in 2022. It's called the Plankton Aerosol Cloud and Ocean Ecosystem Mission. And we think that this will be very useful for this region because it will advance the assessment of ocean health because it will be measuring a range of um, parameters that will be useful. It will even be useful for detection of uh, things like ha harmful algal blooms. So there's a team in our group uh, that are PACE early adopters. So we'll get a chance to develop methods and start utilizing this data quite soon. So you know, if any of you are interested, please do contact us and we'll see how we can help get some of this information when it's available. Just wanted to share that with everyone as well. And then I'd just like to conclude by saying what we have lined up. We will be, and we're currently developing a synthesis report of the climate risk assessment for the region. Uh, we are in the midst of the degree heating week analysis. And once all that is over, we will be presenting our results. Um, in an online format. And then what you see on the screen is an online platform, which we also hope to launch. And then we want to continue to engage with NASA's PACE program and stakeholders in the region to deliver some of that information across to you all. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manishka. That was wonderful. Um, and yes, Put your questions in the question and answer chat. Um, sorry, in the question and answer um, box, and we'll get to them uh, in the discussion session. Go ahead, Fabio. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I'm happy to talk today about climate change impacts on Guatemalan ecosystems. Today, it's Earth Day. And uh, so it's a particular honor for me to be here. The motto of today is to restore, restore our Earth because a healthy planet is not only an option, it's a necessity. And today I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to talk about the necessity uh, to adapt um, uh, about climate change impacts, not only in Guatemala, but in general, the Mesoamerican coral reef. So uh, just to put in context the um, climate change in Guatemala. I just took the data from the latest global carbon project, which is uh, which came out later uh, late last year, uh, and you can see here the emissions of Guatemala of CO2 in comparison to other countries and other regions. And as you can see, Guatemala, at least in 2019, uh, was not really one of the of uh, greenhouse gases, especially if you took if you look if you look at the um, emissions per person, which is the second the, the lowest part of the slide, you see that Guatemala the average Guatemalan person is even emitting less than the average person in Central America. So it it is important to think about that Guatemala is not really one of the nations which are most responsible for climate change, but is one of the nations which is most affected by it, not only the people, but also the ecosystems. The ecosystems of Guatemala and in general of the world are under threat because of climate change. We know about, as Manishka, Manishka uh, said, the increasing temperature, the increasing sea level rise, also the increasing ocean acidification, which is destroying the coral reef. There are also other changes that are effects of climate change, which are maybe less well known or less completely understood. One of these is the change in precipitation patterns. Um, study that came out 
early this year uh, showed that their old the climate models predict a general decrease in precipitation in the Central American dry Central American dry corridor, which is already a arid or semi-arid region at the end of the century, both in a moderate emission scenario, the RCP 4.5, and in a heavy emission scenario, the RCP 8.5. So this kind of change is, of course, impacting ecosystems, which are already under pressure because of low precipitation. Another change, as Manishka and Katie mentioned before, is the increase in extreme events, such as, for example, hurricanes. Central America was hit by a back to by back to back two major hurricanes last November, Eta and Iota. And uh, this study that came out uh, late last year showed that there is a correlation, a solid correlation between increasing temperature and increasing the intensity of such extreme events. So uh, thinking about the impact of extreme events on local ecosystems with uh, two organizations, Pixantia and Healthy Reefs, we started to develop a project to monitor the impact of climate and weather extreme events on a coral reef. Before moving to Guatemala, I didn't even know that new coral reefs were being discovered, but this is the case. In 2014, the Cayman Crown coral reef, coral reef was discovered. It is a really peculiar coral reef in Guatemala, uh, and uh, it is quite deep. It is a 10 meter depth, and uh, it boasts a 60% of coral cover, which is a uh, huge in comparison to the rest of the Mesoamerican coral reef. It is a really peculiar ecosystem with a lot of life and uh, of course, which is under pressure because of climate change. So with a project which is financed by the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, um, we plan to monitor the impact of weather extremes on this ecosystem. Sadly, because of the pandemic, we were able to analyze only the time series uh, between May and October 2019 because it was impossible to recollect again the sensors. We plan an expedition uh, later in May to get more data. So far, uh, as you can see in this slide, there is what we what we analyze basically is a correlation between between the increase in uh, uh, sea temperatures uh, that we measure at, uh, at the coral reef and the pH. Of course, we need more data to assess also the seasonality, this is the seasonality, and also to really understand the impact of events like the hurricanes that we got in November on the coral reef. Here I linked an uh, article uh, that appeared in the Guatemala magazine Entre Mundos about if you're interested in the process of the discovery of this new of this coral reef. Another uh, ecosystem which is definitely under pressure because of climate change are mangrove forests. And they are under pressure because, of course, of sea level rise, but also because of the massive deforestation which is happening in these forests, is in Guatemala. Um, and uh, the National Forestry Institute, the INAB, also monitored that some mangroves are dying because of fungal attacks. And what is interesting is that these fungi are normally found in maize culture. So it's maybe due to the fact that uh, people are not really doing good waste management in agricultural sector. Um, another effect that can be seen in mangroves in Guatemala is that you can see a change in plant productivity, and that is maybe because of the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, this path still has to be explored, uh, but you can also see in the graph above that this increase in productivity is kind of being saturated. And of course, this can impact even more the productivity of uh, mangroves. To conclude, I just wanted to come back to the first slide that I presented to the necessity of adaptation. Um, Guatemalan ecosystems and Guatemalan people, but in general, people all over the center, all over Central America, have to adapt back to climate change. But how? In general, what I believe and what I see in the project in which I'm involved in 
is the necessity of bottom-up approaching, which are involving the communities which live with the ecosystem and within the ecosystems, not only in the implementation of climate change adaptation measures, but also in the planning of these measures to guarantee, guarantee really the sustainability of these uh, projects and these, these measures um, after the, uh, the planning of the, of the measures themselves. One of uh, a really striking case to me is, for example, the case of forest concession here in Guatemala, in Petén, where uh, in the northern part of Guatemala, in the tropical forests, where the local communities were involved in the planning and in the uh, regulation of the forestry, um, you can also you can basically see zero impact of for, uh, wildfires, wildfires. Whereas outside the for these forest concessions where the local communities were not involved, while wildfires are ravaging the tropical forests. So a project like the WWF led Smart Coasts, um, about which other people are gonna talk about later today, and the uh, fact that science is being taken to the community and the decision making um, is involving the community with the power of nature-based solution is one of the sustainable options that I see as a future for um, the ecosystem managing in Guatemala and in Central America. In Guatemala, we have now an opportunity to do so because we are updating the nationally determined contribution, so the commitment of Guatemala to the Paris Agreement. And it is necessary in such a process to involve the local community in a truly participatory process to guarantee, guarantee really the sustainability of the chosen measure of, the, of adaptation. Thank you for the attention and I'm really, to, really happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Fabio. That was great. Um, yes. Feel free to add your questions uh, into the Q&A. I already see people doing so. And I would like to hand it over to Sayeda next. Hola, muy buenas tardes ya, prácticamente. Eh, pues un gusto poder compartir con ustedes un momento y pues por supuesto platicarles un poco de qué es lo que está sucediendo desde el estado de Yucatán. Eh, si me permiten, eh, introducirles rápidamente, eh, Yucatán es uno de los 32 estados de la República Mexicana. Nosotros eh, tenemos ahora más o menos alrededor de 2.200.000 habitantes en una superficie territorial de 39.524 kilómetros cuadrados. Algo muy interesante es que de 106 municipios eh, con los que contamos en el estado, eh, 12 de ellos eh, se encuentran eh, con, eh, catalogados como zona costera. ¿no? Tenemos básicamente 12 municipios costeros en el estado, los cuales, o de los cuales prácticamente todos son parte de algún tipo de área natural protegida, ¿no? algún tipo de grado de conservación. En Yucatán lo que hemos eh, aprendido un poco también de los ensayos, errores, de las situaciones que hemos vivido, por el impacto del cambio climático que es evidente, es perceptible desde muchos sectores de la población, es que necesitamos generar una visión diferenciada de la atención de las zonas costeras. Necesitamos movernos hacia un manejo integrado, un manejo integral de estas zonas que nos proporcionan una, un gran, grandes servicios ecosistémicos para toda la población del Estado. Nuestro trabajo ha consistido desde la Secretaría de Desarrollo Sustentable en poder retomar muchos esfuerzos que durante muchos años eh, por intereses académicos, ya me nos habían, eh, los años anteriores nos han introducido, ¿no? A que información existe, que hay, muchos, hay muchas iniciativas y hay muchos, eh, bueno, muchas personas y científicos comprometidos a generar información que nos va a permitir al sector público poder eh, ser partícipes de una mejor toma de decisiones, ¿no? Esta es una cartera que se ha construido a través de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, la UNAM, que tiene un laboratorio de análisis y resiliencia costera en el estado de Yucatán, junto con otras instancias como el CICI, que es el Centro de Investigaciones Científicas de Yucatán, y el CINDESTAP, nuestro centro de investigación eh, nacional. ¿no? 
Esta es una cartera de resiliencia, es una carta de resiliencia costera, el cual pues más o menos nos ha indicado un poco los análisis que se han realizado, catalogando o semaforizando el estatus de, de, la, de la región costera en función a cuatro factores ambientales que son hábitat, biodiversidad y agua. Y pues vemos que evidentemente hay una región que se encuentra en rojo, que es un gran, una gran área de atención, ¿no? y que precisamente a través de ella podemos diferenciar que es necesario generar estrategias que sean integradas en el sentido de que la solución no es la misma para cada uno de los espacios. Y bueno, esta, este manejo integrado de zona costera, lo que nosotros que visualizamos es que necesitamos enfocarlo hacia los grandes ítems y los grandes áreas que no son las mismas en cada uno de los estados, que no son las mismas para cada, para cada comunidad que habita en, en el país. ¿no? Para nosotros en Yucatán, la propuesta es que este manejo integrado sea a través de la interacción municipal, ¿no? que cada uno de los, de los jefes del municipio, los presidentes municipales, eh, pues podamos interactuar con ellos para incidir pues, en la política pública de nivel muy local. Eh, está el tema de adaptación, por supuesto. La, la gente y la comunidad entiende muy bien que necesitamos avanzar hacia las medidas de adaptación ante lo que está sucediendo y hacia los impactos del cambio climático, pero no se logra dimensionar qué es la adaptación. No se logra dimensionar cómo podemos ser partícipes de las medidas de adaptación. Igualmente tenemos que, por supuesto, aún trabajar con la potencialidad de nuestras zonas costeras y en el caso de Yucatán, pues, todo nuestro sistema lagunario humedales como una de las grandes herramientas de mitigación. Y, eh, y por supuesto acciones muy puntuales en cuanto a la línea costera y a, las, les, y, a los, y a los impactos de la erosión costera en cuanto a la generación de la de, de empleo. Por supuesto hay dos temas que, que nos importan muchísimo, uno es el monitoreo porque nos permite el poder interactuar mucho con la gente y poder platicar con la gente y hacer eh, pues esta socialización de la importancia de las zonas costeras y también por supuesto la conservación de fauna que para Yucatán es muy muy importante toda vez que pues, somos hábitat de especies migratorias y de especies tan carismáticas como la tortuga maya y evidentemente nosotros como, como gobierno estatal en México eh, uno de los grandes temas es que no tenemos grandes competencias de regulación de las zonas costeras, toda vez que todas ellas son de competencia federal. La federación es quien debe de regular desde la Secretaría de Medio Ambiente, desde la Secretaría de Marina, desde la zona pesca y desde otras instancias, ¿no? El, el, precisamente la, la operación ¿no? y la ejecución de muchas de las acciones en zonas costeras. Sin embargo, el gobierno del estado de Yucatán está muy interesado en generar procesos de alineación y de política pública precisamente integrada que nos permitan ser más partícipes de eso. ¿no? Algunos datos muy, muy, muy puntuales para el tema de monitoreo. Se está trabajando mucho sobre la identificación de la línea costera y la generación de vuelos, sobrevuelos con, con ortofotos para ir monitoreando dinámicamente la, la, el comportamiento y la modificación de la línea costera y de las zonas más erosionadas, catalogándolas como críticas. ¿no? Hay algunas obras de protección que se han estado fortaleciendo en el Estado y, eh, y estas pues deben de ser monitoreadas para poder dimensionar el funcionamiento de cada una de ellas. ¿no? Y en ese sentido, pues se ha trabajado ya sobre 2.145 metros lineales en los cuales ya hay alguna, alguna obra de protección y se han establecido rellenos artificiales de, de playa, así como también se han retirado instalaciones que generan erosión costera eh, ya en 30 sitios muy puntuales. ¿no? Eh, un tema importante porque nos permite interactuar y hacer partícipes a la gente son activaciones en valoración de las playas, ¿no? Y ahí pues hemos trabajado mucho con procesos de certificación eh, de playas limpias, playas platino y una playa con la certificación Blue Ocean, en, en la cual pues hemos eh, fortalecido el trabajo con seis municipios y en cada uno de ellos ya hay un comité de monitoreo y seguimiento de playas limpias. En cuanto a especies prioritarias, por supuesto la tortuga marina trabajando mucho 
con esta especie carismática, pero pues también tenemos el flamingo y muchas especies de aves migratorias que también han estado eh, siendo monitoreadas por parte no solo del gobierno del Estado Federal, sino de muchas instancias y organizaciones civiles que eh, pues trabajan en conjunto con nosotros para poder fortalecer sus acciones en el campo. Cultura para la sustentabilidad es este gran tema que tenemos nosotros en diálogos y participación con la población, acompañando las certificaciones, pero también difundiendo la importancia del conocimiento de nuestras zonas costeras, sus servicios ecosistémicos y el conocimiento de que son áreas naturales protegidas que debemos conocer, valorar y conservar. Este es uno de los grandes retos en los cuales nos hemos encontrado y focalizado como gobierno estatal y es precisamente porque las acciones de generación de puertos de abrigo en estos 12 puertos eh, pesqueros que tenemos en el estado pues ha ocasionado la acumulación de arena en el sitio oriente y la pérdida de la dinámica de la arena que no corre como debe correr hacia el lado oriente de cada una de estas escolleras. Y aquí pues hemos coordinado el trabajo para que colocando sistemas de trasvase de arena se pueda eh, pasar el, el, el volumen de arena ya estudiado que debe de correr de forma normal para eventualmente generar procesos de modificación de la estructura y la orientación de las entradas de los puertos de abrigo. Todo esto de competencia federal para poder ir generando menor impacto de estos puertos de abrigo precisamente. Este es otro punto focal que como gobierno del Estado y pues ya nos comentaba el panelista anterior, que la participación social de, las, de los proyectos de adaptación y de mitigación también son muy importantes. El gobernador nos ha, ha, ha sido el creyente de esto y de confiar en la población. Y este festival es un festival que fue creado para celebrar que no debemos pescar en un periodo. ¿no? Es un festival para celebrar la veda de una especie muy importante para el Estado, que es el mero. Y durante todos los dos meses y medio que dura la veda del mero, pues se generan activaciones económicas, eh, culturales, deportivas, eh, de capacitación, eh, también de limpieza de playas, de manglar, ¿no? y, este, y pues muchas más actividades para poder apoyar por una parte a la población costera, pero también para poder difundir la importancia del conocimiento del vero, del mero para el Estado y también de nuestras mismas playas. ¿no? Este festival ha sido un gran éxito para el Estado, eh, reconociendo la importancia de nuestras zonas costeras. Esto les comentaba ya eh, de forma previa y ahí pueden observar en el mapita cómo prácticamente todo nuestro Estado está cubierto por un área natural protegida. Estas son áreas naturales protegidas estatales y ambas, eh, si lo observan en la, en, la, en la línea, toda la costa está prácticamente cubierta de las estatales y los remanentes son áreas naturales protegidas federales, de tal forma que toda la línea costera del Estado es un área natural protegida. Estos datos ya se los había platicado un poquito antes, este es nuestro campamento tortuguero, una de las cosas que estamos muy orgullosos de esto es que nos ha servido mucho para que en las mismas comunidades haya grupos de voluntarios que eh, pues generan las, las, las inspecciones de nidos y el monitoreo de las tortugas, pero también nos han ayudado a monitorear el, el cuidado del manglar, eh, nos han ayudado a cuidar el tema de manejo de residuos, e incluso ya estamos fortaleciendo la, capacit la capacitación para que nos ayuden con el monitoreo de la línea costera, ¿no? empoderando a las comunidades en el conocimiento de sus ecosistemas. Igualmente habían comentado proyectos con estas listas, el Yucatán es la colita de este proyecto, nosotros tenemos dos comunidades inscritas en este proyecto de postas listas, pero nos ha servido para poder dar los primeros pasos para hacer de todo esto que les comento como manejo integrado de zona costera, una política pública detectada y en la cual ahora precisamente como gobierno del estado nos encontramos trabajando para poder generar esto como un documento que pueda ser publicado, que pueda ser reconocido por la población, por las autoridades eh, ambientales y eh, las autoridades incidentes que sean competentes para que esto pueda hacerse eh, permanente para toda la costa. ¿no? Costas listas, como les comentaba, es la base. Ya nos han platicado los panelistas anteriores de, 
de esta relevancia, pero es muy importante el remarcar que esto nos lleva a poder generar con la comunidad eh, soluciones basadas en ecosistemas, soluciones que nos permitan la conservación del manglar, la restauración del manglar con grupos que ya sean, sean capaces de realizar restauración de manglar y de una costera, el manejo integrado del fuego, que pues, para Yucatán es un punto muy, muy importante y que cuidamos cada año de forma muy, muy preventiva también. Y por supuesto un tema que no se habla mucho, pero que es de gran relevancia para el fomento de la biodiversidad y para la conservación de la gran plataforma continental con la que cuenta el estado de Yucatán, que es la conservación de eh, la masa de pastos marinos y lo que conlleva esto en captación de carbón. Igualmente, pues estamos alineando esto con nuestros instrumentos de herramienta pública que son vinculantes, los cuales son un ordenamiento territorial para todo el estado de Yucatán, el programa estratégico de acción ante el cambio climático y esta que les comentaba, que es la política estatal para el manejo integral de mares y costas en el estado de Yucatán. Y algo que quisiéramos y que pues justamente en estos paneles nos gusta comentar, que hay que apostarle como comunidades costeras a poder reconocer y poder generar el valor del carbón azul con lo que con, con los, contamos en nuestros, en nuestros maravillosos eh, sistemas de manglar y sistemas lagunares y poder incluso ya platicar con las comunidades en procesos de generación de emisiones del carbón azul. Este es el gran trabajo que hoy estamos desarrollando a través de este programa ya con, con, con 10 funcionarios, muy puntualmente, SDS y Secotur, que es la Secretaría de Turismo, a la cual estamos vinculando muchísimo con estos temas, pero también con otras, y a la coordinación institucional entre otras instancias estatales que nos permiten, nos permiten llevar esto a cabo de forma muy puntual. Y todo esto enfocado, por supuesto, a que todas las bases las, adop las adapten las adopten y las promuevan las comunidades eh, en las zonas costeras y esperamos que esto pues sea realmente algo que logre quedar como una política permanente para que independientemente de las autoridades que lleguen, los, las, los, las y los ciudadanos en zonas costeras identifiquen, valoren el valor, el valor ecosistémico de cada uno de, de, de sus sitios, de cada uno de sus ecosistemas y realmente lo conserven y lo usen de una forma adecuada, logrando no solamente la participación en las NDCs, sino el desarrollo sostenible que todos quisiéramos ver para nuestras costas, en este caso de Yucatecas. Espero algunas preguntas y cuestionamientos y sobre todo poder invitarlos a Yucatán porque esto nada como verlo en vivo. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Saida. That was wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of those programs. Okay, we are going to now take a short uh, five-minute break, and I'm going to put up uh, a slide here that will um, remind you of the word map activity. So please take a minute or so of your break to, to fill in some of those um, some of those words. And we're going to give Thais, our, our interpreter, uh, a couple minutes here to rest her voice. And we'll welcome you all back um, uh, uh, in just about four or five minutes. Thank you so much.
Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody back. Um, Lori, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Katie. Okay, great. So I just wanted to make, share it with everybody, the word maps that we have going on so far. Um, Lori, can you see my screen with the map? It looks beautiful. Thank you okay. everybody for filling it out. Yeah, so we clearly have a lot of people that are entering words related to climate risk and community and biodiversity and resilience. I also see nature-based solutions, ecosystem services, and I see some words here in Spanish, which I love to see, arecifes, which is coral, and I see manglares, mang mangroves. I also see some policy related um, words such as the NDCs and coastal management and GHG emission. So keep, keep on adding, uh, adding your words and adding the issues that are important to you in your region. I also see, I also love to see some other um, countries in here as well. I think I see India somewhere. Um, so feel free to add uh, whatever these presentations are making you think of. Um, and also feel free to add your questions to the Q&A and our speakers are responding to them. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to our next speaker, who's going to be uh, Eileen. Eileen, are you there? Sure, I, it says I cannot share while someone else is sharing. So can you please stop sharing? Yeah, <laughs> let's see if I can stop sharing. I don't know why I'm having trouble stopping sharing. Um, okay, that work? Good. Yes, it works. Wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to give a quick overview of my presentation today, um, the goal of it is to highlight the importance of how CZMEI, the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute has been using natural capital information to inform the updating of Belize's integrated coastal zone management plan and how we are also engaged in other important processes such as the updating of Belize's nationally determined contribution and also to demonstrate how this um, important information can also um, serve other purposes as well. As you may know, for those who have been working in Belize, the coastal zone provides significant ecosystem goods and services for Belize, uh, as you can see, with tourism is our main income earner. And also important is the fisheries sector, which contributes uh, to the economy and is also an important source of food for coastal communities in Belize. Um, additionally, um, we see that shoreline protection um, coastal protection, um, we gain a lot from the services that the mangroves and coral reefs provide in terms of avoided damages from storms and hurricanes. So um, these are all figures from the coastal capital of Belize, which is a bit dated, um, but we have recent studies that have more up-to-date information. And as you would imag imagine in 2021, um, these ecosystem goods and services are um, even more important now. The Belize Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan was endorsed in 2016. Uh, we heard previous panelists speak about the importance of integrated coastal zone management. And this embodies our framework for ICZM in Belize. Uh, it was done through a partnership with the World Wildlife Fund, the Natural Capital Project, and uh, local and national stakeholders through a participatory approach. 
And really the goal of updating or one of the key goal of updating our plan is to incorporate up to date and recent climate smart recommendations and scientific information to guide the, recomm the policy recommendations in the plan. We also heard earlier a bit about some of the models um, from the Smart Coast project and the ecosystem service analysis that has been done um, in the four countries. And particularly in Belize, this provides um, baseline results with key information on coastal risk, um, what specific areas of the country um, are at highest risk and this information will be used to bolster the climate change and coastal zone section in the plan with a focus on vulnerability and resilience. Um, this is one of the key areas that we hope to strengthen the, the, the plan. Additionally, uh, key sectors like tourism, um, we use the important um, tourism data and maps generated by the, the models, um, particularly to highlight and reinforce the value of the coast. Um, we know that um, tourism is very important to Belize and this information will assist managers to continue to plan for investments, where to plan um, and how to um, make improvements to, towards improving visitor satisfaction. And again, um, highlighting the role of adaptation in this sector is, is very important. In terms of the, the adaptation strategies that have been, the, um, that have been a result of the, the models, we hope to, to use this in several ways. Um, as you can see, one of the strategies is to protect mangroves. And this um, work has allowed us to realize that some important areas for mangrove actually fall do not fall within our protected area system. And so this will be key in terms of um, identifying additional areas for mangrove habitat protection, and also to inform um, investment as it relates to the implementation of these adaptation strategies. Additionally, uh, the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute um, is one of the key partners in the Blue Carbon Working Group, um, which was established to provide technical guidance and support to the NDC updating process. Um, Belize is a small island developing state and we recognize the importance of blue carbon and to this end the 2016 NDC is currently being updated uh, to include targets for mangrove protection as well as improving the management of seagrass as well. In terms of getting um, specific priority locations to inform the targets, um, the analysis was able to, or the models were able to assist us in looking at different targets um, to validate with stakeholders. And so this has been shared with local stakeholders, national level stakeholders to be able to inform the decision making process um, as to what really is a feasible target for, um, for us to include in our NDC. Um, ranging from looking at 5,500 hectares to 10,000 hectares um, and what would that look like and where would the, be these priority areas for mangrove protection and as you can see of course increasing the coverage um, 
we will likely get um, a wider geographic scope of areas where um, we could prioritize. Furthermore, using these targets or these um, different range of targets were then used to help us to identify how much carbon um, these different target areas would store and sequester as this is important data that um, is included in the, the NDC document. Uh, this slide just shows a, a snippet of um, the sectoral targets in the NDC for the coastal zone and marine resources and um, some of the targets that were actually in a validation session earlier today um, to look at these targets and to see if they are realistic for the country, taking into consideration finance, human resources, and so forth. So the targets range from protection targets to targets for restoration, um, for management interventions. And um, as well, the natural capital information is also being used to inform investment at various levels. So we're working with the Inter-American Development Bank on a mangrove initiative, particularly geared to, towards coastal risk reduction and implementing some of the adaptation strategies um, for mangrove. Additionally, we were recently engaged in a process to update our country program for the Belize, um, for the Green Climate Fund. And this, uh, as you all may know, is a, a, a huge opportunity for us to be able to implement these um, adaptation strategies towards um, sustainable use and improving coastal protection. There are other ongoing or pipeline initiatives, such as the updating of the National Climate Change Policy Strategy and Action Plan, as well as the um, development of specific adaptation plans for the fisheries and coastal zone sector, for which a proposal um, has been recently submitted to the Green Climate Fund. In summary, uh, the presentation was aimed at showing a snapshot of how natural capital information can be used to support policy development and planning in Belize. Um, these important strategies will continue to help us to improve habitat protection and make investments through nature-based uh, coastal risk reduction projects. And furthermore, um, these climate data data sets will also help us to support um, the value and cost of mangrove ecosystem, as well as helping Belize to improve its ambition and climate change action plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arlene. That was, that was really excellent. Thank you for sharing all that important work that CDMAI is doing. Okay, I'd like to um, hand it off to Luis now for our final presentation before the discussion. Thank you, Katie. Um, Arlene, I just saw it in perfect. That's it. Let me share my screen. All right, thank you very much for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the experience that WWF and our partners in the Mesoamerican regions, region has uh, working with governments, communities, and private sector on climate smarting, um, protective areas, and coastal zones in terms of planning and management. And I'm happy to do so in Earth Day, which is great. Um, 
I'm going to speak about three specific things. What is our approach in the region? Uh, a, a brief introduction so, to how the ecosystem service analysis looks like. You have seen some already in past presentation through this series and how we are supporting decision making in the region. Uh, just to give you an idea where we are working, uh, this is our below Mar eco region. Uh, and you can see at the, at the right, the number of coastal and marine protected areas where we are working. And our approach is actually a three-pronged science-based approach where we try to analyze climate and ecosystem risk with the support of universities. And we try also to model climate influence on the delivery of ecosystem services, which is, which is important in terms of planning. And after generating this science information, we try to strengthen capacities at, at national and regional level through trainings to undertake ecosystem risk analysis and identify and evaluate risk reduction strategies and adaptation options. And finally, uh, we go over the support decision-making process and try to integrate strategies or options within policies and plans and also we'll be piloting adaptation option measures to, to set an example over the countries we are working with. And this is just possible thanks to a network of partners. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we, go, we, we work closely with governments in each country. Uh, we have different and implemented partners that, that help us to set up uh, academic information, as you can see here, Columbia and Stanford University involved in our work in the region, but also different WWF offices that collaborate in different levels, including local level work at the field. And finally, local project executors uh, that are key partners in, in communities and MPAs that work closely uh, with local authorities and, and business sectors around their MPAs. Um, a quick example of the climate variables that we are using for ecosystem service modeling together with, the, with our partners. Uh, we are talking about sea level rise, precipitation, mean temperature, sea surface temperature, and how this affect different ecosystem services model like coastal protection, sedimentation, tourism, and fisheries. Regarding ecosystem service analysis, as I mentioned, it, we are looking to see how it influenced the climate adaptation strategies and, and also in the benefits that people receive uh, from these ecosystem services. Uh, with example here of, of, of what we are doing with the support of natural capital project, it's for example, the tourism or recreation service where, where we use climate variables such as temperature or precipitation. And the idea is to see how visitation is influenced by nature and climate and how this can change in the future in terms of climate change. Once we have this scenario, uh, we are working again with NATCAD in a restoration opportunities optimization tool. And that help the governments, the communities and the private sectors to decide where activities should be targeted. So here we have brief examples like uh, transition in agriculture to agroforestry to improve uh, sedi sediment retention models or restoring mangroves as, a, as an coastal protection adaptation option, or even restoring coral reef as part of coastal protection as well. And this is possible to, to identify these potential climate adaptation strategies is, is possible thanks to work with uh, local communities and local businesses and government agencies in the field. So we try to go um, ecosystem, we try to look for ecosystem-based adaptation options uh, that are relevant for the, the focal MPAs that we are working with 
and the coastal areas in the region. And of course, this is a, st a stakeholder driven. And it is, this is important because it's people who choose what are the key ecosystem services that they like to protect in the future. Um, and we have done through, we have done this through different workshops uh, in different uh, communities and in different countries, uh, sometimes getting together, which uh, allow us to have a regional approach. And once we have defined this strategy uh, with the support of Stanford, we, we get them represented especially, and that way people can visualize what it means uh, that adaptation, uh, adaptation option in terms of restoring. And also what will be the influence of the influence of this adaptation on the ecosystem services and here you can see a good example of how protecting mangroves might influence tourism and coastal risk on some of the coastal zones of the region and the MPAs. And finally, uh, and this is something that we are working at right now, it's generating an agreement map, map where the adaptation strategies generate the greatest return in multiple services now and under future climate conditions and this involves not just science, but also consulting people and, and taking notes from the field. And once we have all this ready, we, we go over the decision making process. Uh, and as, as mentioned, it's science-based information that are provided to authorities, communities, and business leaders. And the idea is to support decision making at three levels, at local level by, uh, by providing feedback to management plans on the coastal and marine protected areas, providing feedback to municipality and states in terms of land zoning, and even providing feedback on climate adaptation strategies based on the ecosystem services strategies that we are developing through this project and at national level, as you had seen, we are already supporting countries' NDC processes and in terms of updating, uh, also coastal zone management and climate adaptation strategies at national level as well. And at eco-regional level, there is an opportunity to promote regional policies that might, might improve the eco-regional approach of the Mesoamerican Reef and also learning from each other. And this is an important part of the project as we have um, spaces to share with MPA co-managers, different authorities when, where, where they get together um, and learn from each other from their experiences, whether this might be mango restoration or, or planning with communities at local level. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope you like my presentation. Thank you so much, Luis. That was a, a wonderful presentation to wrap us up. Um, I'd like to invite all of the presenters now to turn your video on. And we've had a quite an active um, uh, chat and Q&A session here already over the last hour. So I, I thank all of the attendees for your good questions. You're clearly listening and paying attention. And I also want to thank all the presenters for your, your good answers. Um, so feel free to keep looking um, at that Q&A. And uh, I thought that I'd start off with a couple of questions. Um, that, that I had, um, I thought maybe uh, first sort of, uh, Luis, you shared with us your um, the kind of process that we've been undergoing as part of this inner country uh, sort of collaboration around ecosystem-based adaptation. 
But I also know that you are deeply involved in a lot of work going on in Honduras. And so I wanted to just give you an opportunity to share some of your insights from that work um, with this, this group. And in particular, I'm thinking about um, the devastation that we've seen from ETA and IOTA and also the impacts of the COVID pandemic. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts for people from your experience about engaging with communities that have been suffering from these sorts of um, sort of both natural disasters and sort of health and political issues. Um, how do you go about approaching community members that you're engaging in projects like this, given that wider context? Oh, thank you for your question, Katie. So it is very interesting now after Iota and Ita, uh, looking at the uh, people reactions in the communities. Um, they they are aware now, and, and especially because they were probably influenced by our, by our project and learning about e ecosystem services and ecosystem or nature-based solutions for, for adaptation. And they were reflecting many communities that we have, we have contact with uh, that need to, for example, restore forests in the mountains. And they were reckoning that the communities were more vulnerable just because they were uh, removing forests nearby. And that's, that's an important reflection. And I think it's a momentum. So even though it was a really sad experience for the country to suffer these two hurricanes in, in a month, um, people reflections are, are good. And I think um, taking that momentum and supporting people in, in getting less vulnerable, it's, it's a very important piece for this project. And regarding the COVID-19 crisis, uh, it's, it just make it harder, right? Because we, we try to engage with our partners and with our community members, but it's, it is just hard. And we are uh, trying to do different measures. For example, uh, in the past December, we, we launched a um, South Opera by radio station broadcasting. Um, and the idea of that South Opera was to, to actually educate people about climate risk and, and how they can adapt it. And it was, it was very successful. We, we outreached about 20,000 people in our region, in our eco region, which might sound uh, a, mi a minor number, but it, it is large for the for the type of communities that we work with. And that, that has been a good experience so far, trying to reconnect with them. Of course, we are always trying to find new ways to connect with people in terms of adaptation. Wonderful, thank you, Luis. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, so, uh, Saida, we have a question for you from one of the, the participants, um, and uh, let's see, um, it says, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to read it in Spanish, <laughs> and you'll forgive me, <laughs> and then I will also try to say it in, um, in English as well. Felicidades por la presentación, Saida. Unas preguntas. ¿Quién está dirigiendo la coordinación del Grupo Internacional para el MIZC? Gracias, Katy. Sí, justo estaba intentando responder ahora por escrito esa misma pregunta. Qué bueno que la podemos hacer y así me ahorro la escritura. Este, forman, actualmente la, la, o esta, esta iniciativa, es eso, es una iniciativa, aún no, está, no es un grupo formal, está ahora liderada por la Secretaría de Desarrollo Sustentable en conjunto con un grupo de asociaciones civiles, este, donde está también el GEP, donde está el WWF, ¿no? donde hay varias otras instancias que han conformado una iniciativa por, los costa, por las costas y mares de, de México. ¿no? Entonces, esta iniciativa y nosotros estamos en formulación de esta política, aún con un grupo informal, donde participamos secretarías del Estado, como son la coordinación de municipios, 
está eh, la Secretaría de Turismo, la Secretaría de Pesca y Acuacultura Sustentable del Estado, nosotros, eh, la, la Secretaría de Investigación y Estudios Superiores del Estado y la Secretaría de Salud. Todas estas secretarías y los homólogos de la federación, así como también los alcaldes, y estamos trabajando con grupos muy focales que, que ya tienen actividades. Por ejemplo, el grupo de voluntarios del COCTOMI, que son el, la conservación, el programa de conservación de tortugas. El grupo de, eh, de guías turísticos, que tienen un proyecto con, con Cefo Tour, ¿no? Eh, el, las, las cooperativas pesqueras, ¿no? o sea, como que los grupos de, ya de comunidades sociales que están en línea o actuando son los, nuestros focos nuestros grupos focales con los cuales se están desarrollando este trabajo. La intención de esta política es que al estar generada podamos entonces publicarla, decretarla o concretarla como un instrumento vinculante y entonces sí tener un grupo formal que pueda, que pueda sesionar ya con cierta periodicidad. Bueno. Thank you, Saida. Um, and that kind of leads into a question I have for Fabio. You know, I know you, you focused largely on the impacts to ecosystems in your presentation, which was really interesting, but you, like many others on this call, are involved in a wide range of different projects. And I, I just was wondering if you wanted to share a bit more about the multi-sector process going on related to the NDCs. And Saida was just talking about working across sectors and across organizations. And I'm wondering, Um, sort of how you see that process playing out in, in Guatemala and, and what makes you optimistic um, about sort of these efforts. Thank you very much, Katie. I think it's, it's a really great question and uh, uh, there is not a simple answer. So the idea is that at least for the updating for of the nationally determined contributions so for the commitment of Guatemala uh, to the Paris Agreement, I see in the process that um, the idea is really to try to harmonize the commitments in all the sectors, and at least for the adaptations, uh, the adaptation measures, which is the in, I mean the, the sector in which I'm more involved in, I see that um, all the actors are trying to the look for these connections in the other sectors, something that has never happened before. Sometimes even there were um, conflicts between different sectors. And in this case, what I see is more of a, I don't know, an idea um, for a collaborative um, to uh, discussion towards the same goal. And within this discussion, and I just wanted to briefly answer one of these questions that came up also in the um, question and answer, we are trying to involve the um, Mesa Indígena del Cambio Climatico, which is an indigenous association of the organizations um, of indigenous people, also to overcome some of the, the language barriers uh, that are still there in Guatemala and to involve the local indigenous people in the process, not only um, just saying from above from the government perspective, you have to go, you have to do this, but trying to get the idea of what do you think that it is important to do. Mm -hmm. So this kind of new process is something that makes me optimistic. Yeah. And I'm guessing that sort of um, resonating a bit with Arlene and, and the work that's going on in, in Belize related to the NDCs. And I, I was just, I thought I would ask, give you a chance to respond to this first, Arlene, but also open this up to the floor. Um, uh, we had a question from one of our attendees um, about what you all see as your number one opportunity to push nature-based approaches and what you see as a barrier to advancing nature-based approaches. What are both those opportunities and kind of the barrier that you see? And I'll give Arlene a chance first and then if anyone else wants to jump in. Sure, um, I think one of the, the opportunities that um, we realize from, from these national processes, for example, um, as Fabio had mentioned, we, we too have noticed that in the updating um, 
of NDCs and the targets, and particularly in relation to, to adaptation that um, the various sectors um, have come forth to say that we have things that we can do or targets that we can set, um, for example, for agriculture, um, energy. And so um, that is one of the, the key opportunities that, that we see um, working on adaptation um, across sectors and um, and well, the, the, I guess barriers is um, usually in terms of resources to, to implement um, these adaptation strategies. We have funding that would allow us to perhaps do a pilot, but um, I think while it's a constraint or a barrier, it, it still can be flipped as an opportunity because then this small funding or seed funding can then be used to demonstrate um, the case and that it could be replicated in other parts of the, the country and perhaps um, the approach could then to be um, try to get um, private sector um, more involved in in um, implementing these, for example, mangrove restoration, one of the questions was how do we get um, tourism, the tourism sector on board, which is often one of the drivers of um, removal of mangroves. So definitely, I think while there are opportunities, while there are threats and barriers, they definitely can help us to um, capitalize on the opportunities. Um, well, I actually want to hear more people's response, but I am looking at the time and sadly we are, we are coming to an end. Um, so I am going to have to stop us here. I'm also wishing I had a chance to ask Manishka my question. So we'll just have to, we'll have to follow that up for later. That was the latest exciting science on a global scale that we can downscale to our particular regions. So we'll have to hear, we'll have to get some ideas from Manishka and maybe follow up in our newsletter or something. So with that, I just want to thank all of you for sharing your time and your efforts and your energy. And, um, you know, there's a huge urgency and need for the kind of work that you're all doing. And we're incredibly grateful for your leadership. And um, I'm incredibly grateful to all of the attendees today and for your good questions. Um, I also want to remind everyone that there, this conversation series is continuing and each month or so is a very um, different and enriching topic, um, but certainly topics that all have a lot in common. So even if you're focused on the coast, I would encourage you to join our next um, upcoming conversation on advances in land use planning in the Amazon. And that's happening on May 25th. Um, and you can get more information on the Natural Capital Project website about that. So um, thank you very much. And let me just make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, Lori and the other organizers, are we okay to wrap up here? It was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, take care all. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Go forth on this Earth Day. Thank <laughs> you.